So look over the questions. Does anybody have anything they want to go over from chapter two? outrun a hungry bear. Suppose the two campers, Dash and Slog, are identical twins, so they have the same shoe size. Dash is a faster runner if both twins wear shoes, and if neither twin wears shoes. A person wearing shoes outruns a person without shoes. The bear will eat one camper along with any shoes worn by the victim. Describe the Nash equilibrium in terms of the number of campers who wear shoes. Okay. So what you guys get, I'm not here to review the answers. I haven't even looked at the answers, so this is kind of classroom discussion. Chapter two. Uh, chapter two, yes. Uh, and who asked this one? I didn't see who, okay. So um, what was the answer, first of all, from the answer key? Zero. Mm -hmm. All right, and what did you guys come up to justify zero? So zero meaning the Nash equilibrium in terms of the number of campers. So nobody wears shoes. Is that what we're supposed to interpret by that? Okay. Agree, disagree? By the way, I found errors in the answer keys before, so if you guys don't agree with it, make sure you voice that too. If you think you got something different, this is a, this is a way we find uh, sometimes errors with the answer key. Yeah? I disagree with the answer key. Okay. What did you think it was? Well, it says that um, both were, like, Dash is faster than I both twins wear shoes and neither wear shoes. Um, but the person wearing shoes out runs the other, so the guys would wear shoes every single time. So there'd always be four pairs of shoes. There are two pairs of shoes. Did anybody set up a payoff matrix? I think we could, right? I'm just, again, I haven't looked at the answers. Did anybody set one up? Let's try to do one together. What do we got? Dash and slog. And it's basically wear shoes or don't wear shoes, right? And so the outcome, we could start to put it in payoffs of utility, maybe. So I suppose two campers, dash slog, down they have the same shoe size. Dash is faster runner. If both, oh, by the way, what, what does this thing mean with the bear being, why is it good to be a faster runner? You don't get eaten. So you guys have heard that joke that the, uh, I'm not worried about the bear, I'm just worried about being the fastest runner because the bear is going to take who's ever behind, right? So that's the whole thing this is uh, getting at. So Dash is the fastest runner. Um, if they both wear shoes, if both twins wear shoes, so Dash is going to edge out. So who dies? Slog. Slog. So I don't know if I want to attempt to uh, do this, but let's say uh, 100, 0 for death or slog. Okay. And if they both don't wear shoes, 100, 0 is slog. And so if slog wears shoes and Dash doesn't, Dash dies, and Slog lives, and obviously if he wears shoes, then he's going to really do good here, so. So they both wear shoes, 
So yeah, what would be the Nash equilibrium? Would, would dash want to switch if we were here? Yes. Would slog like to switch? No. Now, it's kind of a push here with the zero, so we kind of got to be a little bit careful, but um, if it's a push, that could be a Nash. Uh, and then would dash like to switch? No. Would slog like to, to switch? No. So we got that one as kind of a weird one too. So this is one of those game theory, at least the way we're setting it up here, if they're ties, there can be um, multiple of not wanting to switch. So that would be a potential Nash equilibrium. And then if we're down here, would he want to switch? No. Would slog like to switch? Yes. Yes. So there's a couple Nash. And so describe the Nash equilibrium in terms of the number of campers who wear shoes. What would you conclude there? Someone's going to wear shoes. Somebody looks like they're wearing shoes. So all they said is zero? Yeah, it said zero. So yeah, I'm not liking that, that answer too much. What's the next one? Describe the Pareto efficient outcome in terms of the number of campers who wear shoes. What, did, what did the answer key have for that? Two. Two. So basically both wear it. Okay. Yeah, the way this is phrased, I mean, would there, uh, if Dash is the faster runner, given the information, um, it's per, first of all, Pareto efficiency is a Nash equilibrium. Would either want to switch? No. So that's Pareto efficient, right? There's not a Pareto improving move. So um, with both wearing, but, um, you know, whether this one, is it? I mean, I'd certainly be wearing shoes if I was slog, knowing that he's going to wear shoes. But so the efficiency gain from switching from the Nash equilibrium Pareto, from the Nash equilibrium to the Pareto efficient outcome. Okay, so they're trying to set up a uh, a prisoner's dilemma. Um, so they're uh, I don't know how much time I even want to spend on this, but. Um, I'm gonna, some of you have seen this, some of you haven't, but Coke and Pepsi deciding on a high or low, high or low. Uh, they both go with a high advertising uh, budget and they get 20 million a piece. They go low and they cheap out, they each make 50. Uh, Coke goes high, Pepsi goes low, they make 100 million, Pepsi gets zero, and then vice versa if it happens there. What's the Nash equilibrium here? The 20s, right? So there's a dominant strategy of Coke to go high. I think that's what the author's trying to do here. But that's different, because that's a zero sum. Isn't the one with the bear a zero sum game? Because you're either eating or you don't get eaten, so your win is the um, loss. Yeah, maybe a little bit of that, but that's what the, the author's trying to get this out of it. It's trying to say we got we've got thirty on the table with um, if we both go low, but each has a dominant strategy of going high, right? So for Coke, twenty is bigger than zero, hundred is greater than fifty. For Pepsi, twenty is greater than zero, hundred is greater than fifty. So this is the Nash equilibrium, but the better outcome for both would be the this. So there would be a Pareto. Um, improvement if they were able to move from this solution to this solution and then the gain the efficiency gain from switching would be 30 for each person that's what the author's trying to tease out so I'll uh, with the other one, I might reach out to them on this one yeah It says recall the exercise. Did you guys look back at the exercise? Did that help? I assume there was an example or something in the book. Oh shoot, did I not bring my book? Oh wait, my book's over here. Did you, guys, did you see, did anybody see anything with the bear example? I'm 
not seeing anything on bears here. We have the left and right. Yeah. I think it's kind of a bad question. Especially if there was nothing on bears in here. Well, it's at the beginning of chapter two. You did see it at the beginning? Yeah, it's at the top. It's in Octavus Science. It's right below the key concept of urban economics, but it's not like really an example. It's more of just a joke. Oh, this little thing here. Two campers awake in their tent to the sound of a bear. Camper A calmly puts on his running shoes and starts stretching. Camper B says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a hungry bear. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. So I think what, uh, I think in terms of these payoffs, they're trying to, uh, I think he's trying to, to get rid of the uh, don't wear shoe option. Like they wouldn't both not want to wear shoes. So I, I'm not going to sit and waste more time on this, but I think you could, you could change the payoffs to get what he's looking for, but I don't think it's the best question. Um, and it might turn out, uh, I might work on it a little bit on the side, but you know, it might turn out that because it's zero sum, I think no matter what, he's gonna have a dominant strategy of wearing the shoes. And so then um, if he wears the shoes, then the zero wearing the shoes doesn't make sense at all for part A. No matter what, yeah, he's a dead meat, so that, that's kind of the whole thing. So, All right, Andrew, you had your hand up? Yeah, it's also question six on the fly of concepts. That's probably why we get to see it. Oh. Does it help? Not really. It's just a ask you to... Two campers awake in their tent to sound the bear. Camper A puts on... Okay, so they kind of redo the thing. I just have to outrun you. Suppose that a person who wears shoes outruns the person without shoes. Describe the Nash equilibrium in terms of the number of campers who wear shoes, right? Yeah, the so there they changed it though. It's not that dash is always faster. It's whoever wears the shoes. Well, which is kind of what we did here too. With, um, if he's not wearing the shoes, well, this is a dominated strategy. Well, what happens if they're it said dash. Yeah. Yeah, six doesn't say anything about dash being faster. It's just in 11 that he says, are identical twins, same shoe size, dash is faster runner if both wear shoes, neither twin wears shoes. So then the other one is faster. So like we said, he's going to be dead meat no matter what. It, it's just not a good question. I, I, I'll try to, I might try to figure out something to make it a better question, and then I'll send it off to the author. But, yeah, so. And so I have my notes for next time, too. OK, but at least we covered Nash equilibrium. We, you know, you kind of want to be able to justify in a situation like this. It's OK, by the way. You're not going to lose points if you don't justify the zero. If you say, I came up with this, here's my work. That's what I'm asking of you guys to think, right? So more than likely, there's not a whole bunch of bad questions and, and bad answers. So likely the, the question and answer is correct, but this would be an example of, don't be afraid to show your work and get a different answer. I'm not gonna take off any points if you have something different. All I'm looking for is that you thought about the problem and you presented the way you think it should work or whatever, and using some economic theory or justification for it. Does that make sense? For everybody so if this, if this comes up again don't be afraid to you know bounce around and maybe a different idea or a different approach so okay any other ones from chapter two yeah Jonathan my brain shut off on number three on fly three oh, hi, building. building height okay so total revenue from a building is R times H 5400 where Ln is the natural log of H is in building heights. The total construction cost is that. 
using a bit of calculus, <laughs> the marginal benefit, which you don't have to do, by the way. He's giving you the calculus. So, but I can see that being scary for some of you who have never had calculus. Wait a second. McCullough didn't say we need to calculus to this class. The marginal benefit is that formula, and the marginal cost is this. To satisfy the marginal principle, uh, H star. What would you guys do for this one, then? Set what equal? Marginal benefit to marginal cost. Yeah, marginal benefit, marginal cost. So these ones um, are the, if you were going to calculate the total, or which I don't know if we need to do it, but in this case, if the benefit of, at the margin of each additional height is that formula, and the marginal cost is six, set those two, marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So it's just like it's we're doing uh, Supply and demand, basically, marginal cost, marginal benefit. We're going to do a lot of these uh, in this class, too. So maybe we're measuring utility or dollars or whatever it is. And so all we're doing is that is the optimal height. So we get 5400H, or divided by H, equals 6H, 5400, divided by 6 equals H squared. And then just take the square root of that, get rid of that, and what's the answer? 30. So h equals 30. Questions there on the calculation or anything? Additional things, questions pop up? Okay, any other ones on chapter two? To get the point we lost in that. To get what? Like I didn't do that. Like sometimes I just grow, grow out of it. That's okay. Um, on something like this, you should calculate. You should show your work to support the answer. Yes. You wouldn't just write the bill. I don't even know how you'd write it. But on quantitative questions with an answer, what I'm what I was saying earlier is that if you didn't get 30, and you got 25, and you're pretty sure your answer is right, then you could put I got 25, the answer's key says 30, and let's talk at review. And you can kind of make your own little note. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is our first one, so we're kind of, kind of get to learn. I really want you guys to kind of back to my thing of, it's not just about doing the homework, it's about actually learning the homework. You guys kind of think through it, struggle with it. Some of them will be more difficult than others. Um, the thing that wasn't asked for here is what is the uh, profit that could be calculated? How would you do that? A little bo Russ bonus question here. How would you calculate the profit or expected profit? What's the profit equation? Total revenue minus total cost. So here. Revenue is uh, 5,400 times the log. 5,400 times the log of 30. And then that's going to be minus our total cost function, which is 1,000 plus 3 times 30 squared. You can do it. Don't do it. You don't have to do it but that's how you would do it. Now, we don't use the natural log very often with our calculators. Some of you might have to, oh, how the hell does that work again? Uh, but it's just a function on your calculator or spreadsheet. Um, we do use natural logs in our capstone class when we talk about transforming demand functions into other things. Um, it's not a big deal. It's just, a, there's a reasons we do it that I'll get into in the capstone when we get there. But. One of the reasons I will tell you that we use stuff like natural logs is that, you know, in principles class and other things, we often simplify with straight lines, but the real world is curvy. And when you start to get into curves, whether it's like that or whether it's like that, then you need sometimes logs and squares and other things. So that is um, how uh, real functions might look depending on the situation. Okay, any other chapter two? Mm -hmm. 
All right, chapter three. Number one on the applied. Number one on applied. Chapter three. The Innovation City. So in the stitch and squeeze example, suppose the shoe output per hour in stitch increases to 16 and the exchange rate increases to 4. A stitch household switches one hour of production time uh, and a squeeze household switches two hours of production time. Uh, that's the part I don't like the way they approach it, but it's, it's doable. Ignoring any transaction costs, what are the gains from trade for each type of household? So, First of all, was it A or B or uh, just parts A and B, I guess? Getting started or? Uh, it was, yeah, it would it'd be part A. I got like half of it to like the net gain of six shoes. Okay. So the answer key had, what was it, net gain of six? So eight shoes, six. Uh, stitch and six shoes go to squeeze, it says. So stitch gets, stitch, is six shoes game? Eight. Eight? Eight stitch. And squeeze has a gain of six. Six? And they both expressed it as shoes, right? Okay, how'd you guys do it? Somebody other than Lawson. Zeke, why don't you come on up and show you bring your paper? I like that. Yeah, you guys should try to bring your papers. Maybe you just normally would have it in your notebook. So, because we'll put that up on the on the screen like this. I have no idea this is here. That's okay. I just set up the whole thing. Kind of followed the way they did it in the book, yeah, and then changed it. To Except I was confused, so when it said two hours, does that mean, so I have one, because it was, they all did one, but I switched to two, it would be, because they did twice as much, so I didn't know if that meant. Uh, only, yeah, only, it said in the problem, only squeeze Yeah, so that's why I, I did two for squeeze, I didn't know either. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it, it, that would be gone if you'd have to start. Okay. And so then where's your gains? So then, yeah, you got it written out here? Yeah, one Show it. Okay, is that showing all your work there? No, I just I didn't yeah. know if it was running off the screen. So. Okay, so part A, where's the two being used? Like, did you have some? Um, okay, so. Did it change the comparative advantage at all? With the 16, it went from, go back to your table there. This is, what was this in the book? This was the eight or eight? 12, it was 12, so it went from 12. So the only thing that changed was this went from 12, from eight to, or 12 to 16. And then the four, it was two. And then the gains from trade was? I think the milk per hour was two. two yeah. Oh, that one changed too then. Yeah, they both were two. Okay. All right, so yeah, that's what we have. okay, that's what we had before, and then the gains part, yeah, that's this part, this little yeah. uh, that you just flipped away. That's how he showed the gains from there. So we're we're just converting. So who had the comparative advantage? Stitch had comparative advantage and Wait, actually, <laughs> It, well, each one has a comparative advantage in something. So who's shoes? Okay, that stitch. Is stitch. So stitch is in shoes. So we're going to have the conversion of uh, production into from um, for shoe production from milk to shoes. And so then, how much we give up? Um, we give up two hours, and then what it was it that the two units was uh, the milk. So we lose milk and we gain 16 shoes, right? So with the trade-offs, 
How'd you guys do this part then? I just wanted to put down, I have that. And this is in Because the only thing I'm not liking about yours is kind of showing the math of where. I did the math on another piece of paper. Okay, that's, I want to see the math. Who's got their math on their paper that could come up? I can go see if I have the paper. Okay. Or did you guys just fudge your way through, or do you, do you? So we had two. I remember how I get the, to produce eight shoes for his niche, it's gonna take half an hour. So then then it gains four shoes, because it's eight divided by two. But I don't know why. I eight divided by two is four. Jonathan? I don't have the math right now. Okay, you wanna explain it? Stitch starts with 16 shoes, and they're, Trading eight for two milks because it's what four milks for one gallon of milk was it on the chart? Yeah, it's four for one now. Well, four for one, and then since they doubled it, doubled the, their milk production, they now have two gallons and can get sixteen or eight shoes. And then they can get eight. Yeah. And that's our eight up here for Stitch. Yeah, I don't know how Squeeze got six though. Anybody with the squeeze gain a six? That was the question that I was wondering. That was the main one, so you kind of got that part? So he gained six, so he, um, and what was it for a squeeze then? And a squeeze household switches two hours of production time. So, so the squeeze stayed the same, correct? Yeah. So basically it was this one for one is still here, but it's gonna be trading two. So now we're gonna have uh, two milks, and it was a gain of six with a three. Yeah, so I guess um, one way to think about it is they're gaining. Because uh, Stitch is giving shoes and Squeeze is giving meal, right? Um, yes. So they can for Stitch to be meal, very shoes. And, but how did we get the six? So, I don't know. It means I'm in. Is he, is he gaining six shoes instead of eight? Like through the trade because he's giving up two milk. That's like, is that like net shoes? I think yeah. What it's getting at? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That yeah. was my cool. confusion. But I'm still um, with uh, with the new gains from trade of four. It's basically four shoes for every milk, right? Mm -hmm. And so the gain. Oh, so the gain is six on top of yeah, he could that have from the two shoes. Because he could have made the two shoes. Like I said, I don't really like the way the author approaches that one with the trades. I like to have like what, what's our starting point, but they 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 just kind of work at the at the margin with the trade offs. But you still have these productivities. So once you're shifting production uh, one way or the other. And then you were fine with B? If the yeah. exchange is one fourth of an hour, if the exchange time, oh, right, and they were at 30 minutes, they were at a half hour before, right? So that, that's where it, uh, I don't think he's real clear with laying out the, the times. So one hour from there, they did two, gain of three to half with the six. Okay, well that sounds clear as mud. Any other ones on chapter three? Yeah, Zeke? Number three. Number three. Wagoneers and bankers in a trading city. Consider an island economy with two products that are transported by horse-drawn wagon in a city trading, in a tr single trading city, there are six, 
60 Wagoneers and 60 Bankers. For each product, transport cost is 40% of the average cost and delivered price. And the price elasticity of demand of, for the product is negative 2.5. Suppose a mud road is replaced by a turnpike, doubling the travel speed, thus cutting in half the number of wagoneers required to handle any given volume of trade. The number of workers is proportional to the volume of trade. So volume of trade increases by what did you get? What, did, what was the answer key for that? 50? 5 0? Okay. So, how did we get 50%? This productivity is doubled. So, the volume of trade increases by 50%? Is that using the... It would be 100% if, say, both sides doubled, but only one side did. Okay. How'd you guys get this? Other people? That's what I, I, I was going to do some part of you. That's what I just... Oh, saying. you got the part. You got this one. So, so half the number of Wagoneers, volume of trade, number of bankers proportional to the volume of trade. All right, so the volume of trade increases by, so we have quantity going up by 50%. And what happened, does that elasticity kick in here at, at all? Average cost, delivered price for each product, transport cost is 40% of the average cost. All right, so compute the effects on the turnpike, the number of bankers, the number of wagoneers, total employment. So what's the answers, first of all? D is uh, 30 more bankers, 15 less wagoneers. 30 more bankers. And what did you say? 15 less wagoneers. Okay, how to get that? Done. Uh, I just said the number of bankers increases 50% since in part A it increased 50%, which would boost them to 90. And then since with the new turnpike for every two bankers, you only need one wagoneer, which leaves them to 45. With the 15 less, with uh, so just applying those percentages. I, okay. Anybody else do it differently? And I figured because the wagoneers can do the job in half the time now, uh, there's going to be a two to one ratio from bankers to wagoneers. So like 90 to 45 is kind of awesome how I figured that out. Oh, okay. That ratio. Okay. Anybody else? Does yeah, I don't that know how how you get the fifteen fifteen less wagoners. I thought that was thirty thirty less because it's doubled, so you need half of it. How did you do that again, Jonathan? I'll just write it down as you said. You did the sixty. There was sixty. The number of bankers increases fifty percent, so half of sixty is thirty, so we go up to ninety. Yeah. Okay. And then for so this equals thirty, of course, right? So this one goes to ninety. Yep. And then for every two bankers, only one wagoneer is needed, which leaves it with 45. Okay, so then following it from the bankers, um, for every um, okay. for every two, it's, this basically is divided by two, right? Yeah. For every one, there's two, giving us 15 less wagoneers. Okay, total employment, what was the answer to that one? employment goes up by we had some growth of 15 right in terms of number of employed people whether you're a wagoneer or whether you're a banker okay other ones on chapter three yeah number 
number five. Number five. Oh, I, I did kind of want to, it seems, did we use this elasticity of demand at all? What's the elasticity of demand formula? Percent change in price over demand. No, price over quantity. 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 Quantity over price. Quantity. Over price. Okay. And trade volume increases. Could we use that at all here? Of how the 50%? Yeah, so we had 2.5. equals percent change in quantity over percent change in price. Did price, do we have the percent change in price? No. Mm -hmm. And then the average cost in a competitive market is equal to the price? So he kind of hints at it here, just saying the, the delivered price. So price equals average cost in a competitive market. In other words, they're earning a normal profit, right? So at zero economic profit. So then we'd have kind of a 40% thing going. So then, uh, and price is going up or down? Down. Down, so that's a negative. So then we'd have negative, um, 40 times 2.5 equals percentage change in quantity. What's 40 times 2.5? 100. Yeah. 100. Okay. So, and that's 100% in what? So the price elasticity demand for the product is 2.5. Mud road turn back to So what do you think about that elasticity thing there? is proportional to the volume of trade. Is there sometimes information in the problem that you don't need? Is this an example of that? Looks like it, right? It didn't have the answer. Uh, but I thought it was worth kind of bringing up, like, if we see the elasticity, you know, where does that play in? Volume of what trade? So is that the trade? This 40% thing's a little bit weird the way they got it, and it's proportional, so. Okay, just wanted to bring up the elasticity. Um, what, what, what one did somebody just say? Five. Five? Number five. Using figure 3.2 as a starting point, suppose a new production technology has five times the capital cost and five times the labor productivity. Compute the new value for the average cost of production. So 3.2 as a starting place is this picture. Okay. How'd you guys do this one? Okay, so five times that gives us 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. Add it all together is 0. 0.78, and then you'll divide that by five. And get the answer of 0. 0.156. 0. 0.78, you said. Yep. And then divide that by five because it's uh, changed the price by four. Is that, so then divide this by five? Yep. Because why? Because the question said it changed it 
five times. Yeah, five times the labor productivity. Okay. So you find out by climbing the answer. Ah, okay. And what did that end up being? 0.156. And that is the cost divided by five because of the increase in productivity per unit cost, basically, right? I see some head shaking. Does that make sense, Carlos? So you, you spent more money on capital, but the capital made you five times as productive. So then your average, your cost per unit actually went down because you're so much more productive. Even though your total cost went up um, with operating, yeah. it ended up saving per unit. So then on our, this is related to the martini glass. What changes with the martini glass? Kind of Russ bonus question. It gets shorter, the stem gets shorter, right? So the stem is the amount here. And so now instead of being 0.3, it's gonna be 0.156. So that'll shrink, which would then increase the market area, right? Because now you'd have still the same slope with transportation costs, but your market area would be bigger and you could compute a new market area. Yeah, John? Uh, seven on What'd you say, seven what? Seven on a fly. Okay. All right, so consider the effects of a new matter transmitter on a factory town. I love this problem. Okay, the matter transmitter can instantly transport goods, but not people, from the factory to any consumer up to 12 miles away with zero marginal cost of transport. The hourly rental cost of a transmitter is one gallon of milk. Use figure 3.3, three, show the effects of a matter transmitter. What did you guys get for this one? I think this one's fun. Football shape. We could play uh, Star Trek Next Generation with a matter transmitter. Right? So you got a football, why don't you come up and show, you got a picture? Uh, yeah. Or you could just put your paper on the document. Oh, sure. Yep. Or you were, if you're anxious to draw on the board, like I get to all the time, that's fine. That's my favorite. Okay. So what? Tell me what's going. Let tell everybody what's going on with that. So it costs one milk. Uh, and it's like instant travel, so it's not going to be a diagonal shape anymore. It's going to be a straight line up above that. So yeah, draw. Use your finger to show what your martini glass transformed into. I guess it went from the diagonal straight up uh, ten cents because it cost ten cents more for that milk. Yep. And that price will be the same all the way across twelve miles because I mean, it's not increasing as the mileage gets longer until that cutoff point where they can't sell anymore outside of that range so it goes straight up okay anybody questions comments john why did the price go up 10 cents so that's what i struggled with the factory cost went up to 1.4 it goes the matter it's the uh, the transaction cost to use the machine uh, yeah milk was worth 0.1 yeah it was it was 0.1 okay yeah so then that bumped it up and we got goalposts now, or a goblet. Sometimes I, I've kind of thought of it as a goblet. Um, but So now we got the flat thing with the matter transmitter. Any questions on that? Thank you, Lawson. No yeah, question? I get the point one, but how do you get from one gallon milk per hour to 2.1? Like to what? To point one on the graph. Like I get that it's one, like it's one gallon milk per hour, but where does I guess I'm just lost from how it gets from 0.3 to 0.4. Um, so no matter whether you live here or here, remember, let's, let's go back to review this. So if you live here, then your net cost of the product's going to be this dollar amount. Why? Because 
there's the actual dollar amount, and then there's the cost of the transportation to get it to you. So that's what's ramping up your transportation. But now, the cost of the transportation is uh, the cost of the product, um, plus, I should say the cost of the product, plus the cost of the travel. And it's, it's flat no matter what for that person. Jonathan? How does the gallon of milk translate into one part to point one? See the well, this is all measured in milk anyway. So it's just, it costs point one gallon? I don't, I don't recall exactly. I look from, at the problem again. Okay, go ahead and look at the problem. I mean, that's right underneath your paper. Underneath your paper is the book. So the rental hourly rental cost of the transmitter is a gallon of milk. Did everybody else get point one or not? I don't have the answer, so. Did you guys raise it by point one, or was there another? I just I figured it would either stay at point three or go all the way up to one, since the rental cost is one gallon of milk. But then it would be one point three in total. Right. Point thirty-eight. Point thirty-eight. So well, it has something to do with that um, that hour. Did did it say that, that in the answer key though? Was it point one or is that just is that lost in the yes, answer? Yes, no, it's it's price point four, so it went up. Point one. Oh, it did say point four. Yeah. Okay, so it went up point one. Um, was it with the breakdown? Um, if we go back to, you can go grab your seat. Yeah. Actually, let me keep your paper for a sec, just in case we need that. Yeah, that's what I use. I can't, I just couldn't remember. Sorry, I was gonna look. No. So this was the total, was the point three eight, or point, yeah, point three. And then the, um, the cost of a homemade was one, right? Is there a trade-off? You know, uh, unless you guys did something different than me, but I'm thinking typo. Because look at how easily we can correct this by doing I think that's what it would be. Yeah. It, it, it's just 0.1 gallon of a milk, so I, I think that's a typo. Because it can't be one. It, that would raise it above the home. I think that's what I was thinking when I put that down last yeah. night, that, that it had to be point one. Yeah. Okay. I think, did we do every single problem? <laughs> I think we did. Yeah. All right. So that wraps up that part. All right. So continuing on with our... Next stuff. So I want to introduce you to this model. I think we were ready for this point. We'll see where we're at on that. So we, we introduced the agglomeration economies was the kind of the new concept. The whole thing that uh, Glazer was talking about in the cities of people coming together, um, external effects that are within an industry or outside of the industry, so it might go across industries. So this is the agglomeration. And there's four things that the chapter covers, four different little models and concepts. And so I think this is about where we left off of the intermediate input. So something that one firm produces that another one buys. So I had the ceiling fan go out when the lightning struck my house. 
and I got online, like I got a new ceiling fan from the insurance company, but then I'm like, huh, I wonder if the, a switch burned out or some gizmo. So I got online, I ended up buying this um, trans, transistor, I think is basically what you call it, a little box that has the wires coming out of it. Yeah. And uh, as I did my research, it works multiple ceiling fans. Like it wasn't, and ceiling fan companies. Like this is just an intermediate input to making a ceiling fan. It's one product that is kind of a standard thing. It was eight bucks, right? And so they make a zillion of these, economies of scale, and um, they're able to, to sell them. So um, so they're the, um, the ceiling fan producers can kind of maybe share that thing, and that's not maybe a good example of being necessarily physically close with each other. So here's our economies of scale with the intermediate input, if that gizmo can be used. This is just our economies of scale graph, long run average cost, remember? So a lot of you get the cost thing, but it is long run cost, so uh, where we can vary um, production over the long haul and get some gains in, in cost. So here's my little thing is right here, $7.99 on Amazon, delivered free, and I've got my ceiling fan working again by replacing that. Took a little bit of rust labor to do that. <clears throat> okay, so we mentioned the dressmakers before, and so when we start to get in physical proximity, similar to what Glazer was talking about in the book, we might need FaceTime. Like it's just, it's a complex enough issue. So if you guys think about why do we talk face to face as opposed to uh, by phone, what would be important with face to face? What do you get out of face to face as opposed to a telephone conversation? Trust, genuineness. Okay, trust and genuineness. What, what else? Facial expressions. Facial expressions, gestures, hand gestures. Now, a lot of that we get from Zoom, so if we change it to a face-to-face, -face, but we don't necessarily get all of that either, right? And then we, you can run into other complications. So um, these uh, incidental contacts uh, is another place where FaceTime can make a deal. So um, what about this small and nimble? What does that mean there? Small and nimble dressmaking firms. What would that have to do with? What comes to mind for that? There's probably not a huge demand for them. Yeah, okay. So they, they might be small and boutique-y. What does it mean to be nimble? Or what do they have to, what's... Move from place to place. Move from place to place, be willing to change, be able to switch fast, right? So if you're, um, so if you're in a dynamic environment, um, that can be a different environment than being in a very stable environment. So to be nimble is to be able to say, oh, I can call up George or I can walk across the street or whatever. Um, so that, that's some other pieces of this puzzle. All right, so that looks like a good place to wrap. And tomorrow we'll get into the, or not tomorrow, Thursday, we'll get into the common labor pool. What's due Thursday? Um, Thursday. I didn't have I didn't have any due dates set up for Thursday, so yeah. So well, this is we still got to get through uh, chapter four. But definitely read through chapter four. How you doing? Is the book in the bookstore? Right You're going to go check? Yeah, they ordered it last Wednesday. Okay.